Greetings in the name of Christ. I am so glad to be back with you all. I missed being with you all last week. I am so glad to be back. Good to see all of you here today. I want to give you a, a hearty welcome to First Baptist Church of Whiteville today, especially if you are a guest. If you are a guest, we do hope that you find this a place of worship. We do hope that you experience God in this place in a mighty way. Um, each morning we gather together, we, we remember that this is our time to worship. And so this morning, I'm going to ask you to do just that. I know if you're like me, you've got all a ton of things going on in your minds, all the things that went on this week, all the things that are about to take place this week. But let yourself be fully present in this place to experience God in a very mighty way. And, and I'm going to invite you all to do just that as we go to the Lord in a moment of silence. Will you join me in a moment of silence? Amen. You will find in your bulletin a responsive reading with the song response. The song response actually comes from the last verse of this scripture. Those who bring sacrifice, uh, those who bring thanksgiving as their sacrifice, honor me. So we will hear the organ play at once, the choir will sing it, and then we'll ask for you to sing it with us, and then we will begin the responsive reading.
with me. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Let the king. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. Mark this then, you who forget God, or I will tear you apart and there will be no one to deliver. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? Holy and loving God, creator of the heavens and the earth, Lord, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to be with us in this time, in this place. Help us to be fully present and to be fully seeking your Spirit to be with us. Help our worship in this time to be pleasing in your sight. Help us to set our minds and our souls on the way of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, the way. It is in his name we offer this prayer. Amen. One, three, and four. Let's sing together.
I'll be reading from Isaiah 1, 1, and then we're going to skip over to 10 through 20. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings in Judah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instructions of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of birth, burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the, bull, in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feast and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make, make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. For the people of God... Epistle reading today comes from Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, and 8 through 16. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed of God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as in his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, 
was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The offertory hymn is number 352, Faith of Our Fathers. Would you stand as we sing together, 352. If you would bow your heads, please. Dear Lord, as we come to you this morning in offering, let us take the time to thank you for the opportunity to be able to gather in your house, to be able to worship you together as a church, openly and freely. This opportunity is only made possible to be in a country that allows us this right and this freedom. Allowing us this freedom, giving us this freedom from our country, allows us to be able to lock shields in faith, making us stronger together, whereas if we were worshiping alone, we would be less. This strength, when you apply it, allows us to be able to go through life's tragedies, be it at a national, le be it at a national level. The understanding and digesting and mourning and combating these tragedies, be it at a national, a community, or individual level. This church is truly a phalanx of faith. And an integral tool in this phalanx is our gift of offering. It is a testament to our trust in you and that our gifts will be used for your glory. Whether we give out of the commands found in Leviticus, whether we give out of recognition of your love replete in the New Testament, or whether we give as a show of thanks for the bountiful success that you've given in our lives. 
Collectively, our giving enables our gifts to be multiplied exponentially. So please, let us give generously and let this offering be a testament to our trust and love in you and let it exponentially multiply in our community, in our church, and in our nation. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, who can tell me what happens tomorrow in Whiteville? What happens tomorrow? School starts. Are you ready? Are you ready? Well, this morning, Pastor Ryan is going to be talking about a scripture that talks several times about being ready. But now he's talking about a different kind of being ready. He's talking about us being ready to live with Jesus. But I want us to talk this morning a little bit about being ready for school tomorrow. The last two issues of the news reporter has had information about how your parents and you can be ready for school. It goes on and on about back to school 2019 in Columbus County and in Whiteville. Tells a lot of information about how you can be ready for school. Now, in my mind, I can still hear my mother coming down the hall and saying, girls, are you ready? The bus comes in 10 minutes. And it took us five minutes to get to the bus, so we had to really move. Now, tomorrow morning, you might hear your mother or daddy say, are you ready? Don't be late. We have to be ready. Now, the way we're ready to live with Jesus forever is how we live, how we treat each other, what we say and what we do. 
by learning scripture and by praying, we get ready. Shannon, are you ready? Okay. I want you to be ready, all right? Now, this morning, we're going to do a little something. We've got Mr. Charlie sitting up here, and he's going to go with um, whose children's church today? Oh, she's already gone. Um, he is going to take you over to the fellowship hall because everything's locked up over there. He's going to take you over there, and I'm going to give you some school supplies so that you're ready for school. But at the end of the scripture that Mr. Ryan is using this morning, it talks about if, we're, if we've been given a lot that we have to share, a lot is asked of us because we've been given much, and that's how the scripture ends. So this morning, I want you to decide which item you want to keep and which one you want to put on the mission table for a child that might not be ready tomorrow morning. And so that way you can be sharing. And perhaps when you shop for school supplies, you might ask mother and daddy if you could buy an extra item to put on the mission table. There might be some kid in our area that's not ready tomorrow, and we can help make them ready by sharing. So come and get your items, and I want you to go with Mr. Charlie. Come on. Come on. I want you to take these, and you decide which one you want to keep, and then you share one on the mission table, okay? There you go, buddy. Have to even be ready for kindergarten, don't we? Now, I don't want you to run. I want you to walk with Mr. Charlie, okay? And then go to Children's Church. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Are y'all ready for school? We're kind of ready. There's some things we're ready for and other things we're not ready for. I know other parents here are like, maybe, maybe. Great, great children's sermon. Thank you, Martha, for that beautiful message. Are you ready? Well, are you all ready to go to the Lord in prayer? Will you join me in a word of prayer? Holy and loving God, all over your creation, this world is so beautiful and yet so wounded at the same time. We name beauty all around us. And yet when we turn on the news or we pick up the phone now and then, we get word of tragedy and struggle and injustice. We name you in the presence of the good and the bad, the wonderful and the difficult. God, walk with us through all of these times and help us to lift you up in the midst of them. Today we pray specifically for all of us who are heartbroken because of all the suffering that exists in the world, especially as the news of the shootings in El Paso, Texas, and Dayton, Ohio continues to haunt us. Lord, forgive us for creating a place where this could happen. Lord, help us. Help us to lay down our personal biases that prohibit us from offering genuine solution that might minimize people's ability to commit these beastly acts of hate. And God, help us not to allow hate to beget hate. That even though we are angry, that we are hurting, lamenting, that we choose the way of love, however difficult that may be for us. We pray for your presence with those among us 
those we know and those we will never know, who ail and who struggle with real oppression, lacking the evidence of hope. Hear all our prayers, here and the prayers of your people around the world. Lord, we heed the calling to dwell with you and with one another, which sounds so easy yet becomes so hard at the same time. Help the teachings of your Son, Jesus Christ, to to dwell in us richly as we seek to dwell with you and each other richly, richly, joyfully, but with responsibility. And we pray all these things in the name of the one we look for and who looks for us, Jesus, the Christ, our Savior, and your Son. Amen. Today, uh, I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke, reading from chapter 12, verses 32 through 48, if you'd like to follow along. And I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And I love how this scripture starts. Very meaningful for us today. One second, are we on? My battery's dead, which means I'm going to stay right here today. Sorry about that. Thank you all. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. 
If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for everyone? And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and the prudent manager whom his master will put in charge of his slaves to give them their allowance of food at the proper time? Blessed is the slave whom his master will find at work when he arrives. Truly, I tell you, he will put that one in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says to himself, My master is delayed in coming, and if he begins to beat the other slaves, men and women, and eat to eat and drink and to get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and in an hour that he does not know, and will cut him in pieces, and put him with the unfaithful. That slave who knew what his master wanted, but did not prepare himself, or do what was wanted, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. The word of God for the people of God. So I realize that this morning... I am addressing you one week after yet again two more mass shootings in America. You know, I think to myself as a pastor, as a person who proclaims the message of God each week in the pulpit, what do you say? What do you say? You know, and sometimes we, we, we just, we almost are numb to it. We become numb. It just keeps happening. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. So we just turn it off. What do you say? But I do find comfort in God's word. I do find comfort in the words of Jesus Christ. And I find comfort in the very first words of today's reading. He says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You know, I prepare these messages uh, usually a month in advance. I begin thinking about, praying about how God is moving and as the day gets closer, I begin to look at, at what I prepared and say, well, does this still fit? And this morning, quite a lot had changed because of these mass shootings and the way that we grieve and we lament and, and, and hurt as those who, are, uh, who have loved ones who are hurt grieve. It's hard, it's hard to hear week in and week out or as many times as it continues to happen. So as I look back at this passage, these words spoke to me much louder than anything else in this passage. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And that is, I think that's hard to fathom sometimes. Wouldn't you agree? Isn't that sometimes hard to fathom? in the midst of suffering and injustice in the world, that that God still loves this place, loves us when this could happen? And I think that was the very question that I think led to one of the best conversations I've ever had about God with a friend who had actually left the Christian faith. He'd um, grown up in the Christian faith. But for many years, he just stopped believing in this Christian God, at least the God that was presented to him through his church. 
And he essentially, because of he was in the military and he traveled the world, he got to see a lot of things. He spoke of all the pain that he witnessed, the suffering, the injustices that he had seen with his own eyes. He spoke of sex trafficking and numerous other things, and even referenced the mass shootings, not even referring to the two that had not yet happened. I mostly just listened. It wasn't my job to correct his thinking at that time, but to listen to his hurt, his pain, until he finally asked me, how do you think a God who loves us could allow that to happen? That's a real question. That's a real question that people are struggling with. And I'm going to, I mean, I have to confess, I am not without these struggles. I know God, I proclaim God all the time, but there are moments in this world where my grief is so great that I also struggle with these thoughts. So I did my best to affirm his question, uh, affirm what he'd seen. He's seen things that I haven't seen. Not that I haven't experienced suffering and pain, but I cannot deny that injustice happens every day to people who don't deserve it. But it is my belief through the gospel story of Jesus Christ, through the biblical narrative, as I understand it, this is a God who also gives us the freedom of choice. He desires to show us his kingdom, but he also, because he loves us, allows us to choose not to follow his way. And time and time again, we all choose not to follow his way. Whatever is going on in our life, whatever day, week, month, year, we have a lot of perspectives that make us think that we know better than God knows. And the farther we get from his will from our lives, the, difficult, the more difficult it is to understand and hear his voice. And while he had a hard time understanding the Christian God, it is my understanding and my belief, and he allowed me to share this with him, that it is only through the understanding of a Christian God where any of this makes sense. You know why? Because I believe in a God who cares so much, so deeply, that rather than sit up there in heaven and watch, He sent a son to walk among us, to live life, to breathe life into his lungs, to experience pain and suffering, to feel what we feel. Because he cares that much. So when we look at Jesus upon a cross, we can see, wow, our God does care about our suffering and our pain, and he knows something about it. So let me say that I think it's okay that we hurt. I think it's okay that we acknowledge that something is not quite right. And if Jesus is right in what he's telling us in this passage, we have a responsibility to do something about it.
What does that mean? And I don't know that I can tell every person here what that means for you. Because that's our role as Christians, people who are in tune and communion with the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about that word communion. You see that printed in your bulletins. The word communion. And I know that that means something to each and every one of you. And I think for a lot of us, it means the bread and the cup. The Last Supper. But I want you to think about the definition of the word communion. What does that mean? I saw a definition that that said, a joining together of minds or spirits. In other words, the perfect harmony. As in the way that two or more people have choreographed the perfect dance together. So when we think about communion, just don't just think about the cup and the bread. But when you think about what Jesus Christ did for us, allow yourself to be in full communion with that God and his people. Perfect connection with God and his people. That's communion. Yesterday we did something with our kids that... um, we thought it was going to be very special. We heard, we heard yesterday morning that the sea turtles were going to be hatching there on Ocean Isle. There were several nests and, and one that was ex, um, that the experts, I'm going to put that in quotation marks because it's like the birth of a baby. You think the baby is going to come around this time and so they do their best to let the people know, well, this is when we think this nest is going to hatch based on what we see. And so their projection was from anywhere from 7 o'clock from 9 to 9.30, we think that that this nest nest is going to hatch and all these little baby sea turtles are going to be making their way to the sea. So we took our our two little children to Ocean Isle. We drove them out there and um, and, and we we set up some chairs uh, right around this little pathway, the, the the experts, the the people in the orange shirts, the volunteers, they create this little lane. They want to make it as easy as possible for these, as they say, the oreo size shape sea turtles to make their way to where they need to go. And as we waited, we we talked to the experts. We're like, you know, what are we going to expect? What are we going to see? And they started teaching us all these things that I had no clue about. And I'm, I'm sure you guys... Y'all probably know a lot more about this than I do, but the sea turtles instinctively know what, around what time they need to hatch while all the birds are not around. It's cool enough that the birds are going to be out of town or away from the beach at least. So that's not a danger for them. They instinctively know when to come out of the ground And then when they get up out of the nest, they instinctively, innately understand exactly how to get to the ocean. That's that's mind-boggling. These little Oreo-sized animals, it doesn't seem that far for you or I to walk, but something that small to get all the way to the ocean, that's an amazing feat. But they know, they just know where to go. I asked one of the experts, how do they know? How do they know? They said they're actually in tune with a lot of different things going on. There's like a, a GPS inside their head that helps them to 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 kind of know, but they're listening with their ears, they're seeing with their eyes, see where the moon is located, they actually go to the light and they go to the sound and that's what helps them to get where they need to go. And when they get in the ocean, they begin to tap into this GPS inside their body and the, the, the magnetic poles help them to know which way to go. You, you understand how phenomenal that is, right? 
I can see it on your faces. You get it. That is phenomenal. But what does that have to do with us humans? And you know, I think, I believe in this way of Jesus Christ. And when we talk of communion and what Jesus says here, that it is our Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom that we know what is right and what is wrong. If we allow ourselves to listen to God's voice, to be in communion with God and to seek that out, not just at certain times of the week at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, but every moment of every day, seek out that God who speaks to the turtles and guides their way This is a God who wants to reveal his will to us. But isn't it also true that we would rather hold on to all the things that we think make us, us? You've grown up in church. Most of you understand this story. We call it sin. It's also called ego, or you can call it whatever you want. If you think you know what is better than God knows, it's wrong. We hold on to the things that we think make us us. We hold on to all of our hurts of the past. Rather than forgive, the people who hurt us, we make it part of us. We hold on to it. The, prejudice, the prejudices that our world teaches us, we let those things define our understanding of Christianity. Prejudices of our world become a part of us. Another thing, the possessions that we have Keep us from being truly free to following God. We would rather hold on to all of the things that we think makes us us. Those are the things that keep us from being in full communion with a God who loves us. How about we all do a little bit better job of seeking out a God who guides even the baby sea turtles? They don't just figure it out. They instinctively know because God has planted in them the desire to know. Don't you think that we have that ability too? And if you ever get lost, if your GPS ever feels broken, we have a compass. His name is Jesus Christ. Suffering and justice does exist in the world. But our Lord is one who shows us, I will suffer with you. And I'm willing to because that's the kingdom of God. That's love. As we come to the table today, let's try truly to seek communion to our Lord's table and understanding fully where that GPS is, what he did for us with his body what he did for us by shedding his blood so that we might be in full communion and understand fully which direction our Lord wants us to go. Will you join me in a word of prayer? God, we just ask that you show us your way. Forgive us when we choose our own path. 
when the hurt becomes so great that we blame you instead of looking for you. Help us to achieve full communion with you this morning and each and every day of our lives. It is in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. This morning, as we prepare our hearts and our minds for receiving the Lord's Supper and for communion, I do invite you to stand and sing our hymn of commitment this morning, number 519, Face to Face with Christ my Savior. Let's stand together and sing. we just ask that you bless these elements this morning, your cup and your bread, that we can fully understand the gift that you have given us in your Son, Jesus Christ, to be thankful and grateful with all of our hearts and all of our souls so that the joy of Jesus Christ can live in and out through us. And all we say is this. 